put out a note here. Uh, the topic is the bond between victim and victim advocate. And so um, we have Bovita Johnson Harrell. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Bovita? I hope so. Okay. Uh, she is the founder of the Charles Foundation as a co victim of homicide. She's also the supervisor for victim services and restorative justice at the Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner's office. Uh, we've heard so many good things about Bovita over the years. It's great to actually have you here. Welcome, Bovita. And Melanie Nelson is the executive director of the Northwest victim services um, in Philadelphia. Uh, Melanie says, my passion to serve victims and witnesses of a crime, my passion is to serve victims and witnesses of crime. I will serve until my dying day. I forget even how we met Melanie, which is kind of an informal advice for the project and you can find out our stuff. So um, without further ado, please join me in welcoming um, Avita Johnson Burrell and Melanie Nelson. Now, 
Walk with me through another journey. I get a call from a funeral director who says, Melody, I need you to work with the mom. I call this mother, and this mother tells me her daughter was murdered by her ex husband She's at work in Plymouth meeting. She goes out to meet this, her ex-boyfriend. She gets in a car with him. He begins to physically assault her. She gets out of the car. That's not enough. Then he gets out of the car with her, and he begins to stab her. So much so, the knife breaks off in her back. That's not enough. <clears throat> there are co-workers who are witnessing this, and they're free. He gets his Chevy Avalanche truck, and he rolls over her multiple times. Mom cannot even identify her daughter. The family cannot have an open casket to have closure. Another case, all while we're dealing with this summer and up to the present. So then I have another journey I would like for you to take with me. I have a 91-year-old mother who receives a call that says, you owe money to the IRS and the FBI is involved. We're going to mail you a briefcase that has a combination of locks on it. It has $15,000 in it. So once you mail us the money to pay off your taxes, we'll give you the code. So this wonderful, lovely 91-year-old woman makes one payment to them, makes two payments to them, makes three payments to them, makes four payments to them. $67,000 later. So this woman is now scanned out of her pension and the pension that her husband has left for her. So these are the things that are going on within the Northwest section of Philadelphia and Philadelphia as a whole. Unfortunately, Northwest Victim Services is not an agency that people run to, but it is good to know that we are able to assist. So we help victims of crime within the Northwest section of Philadelphia. All of our services are free. We help with unpaid medical bills, lost time from work, funeral expenses, relocation, mileage, child care, loss of support, and we're also in the Criminal Justice Center three days a week, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. So we accompany our victims. We work very closely with the district attorney's office if someone is apprehended. So these are just a snapshot of some of the cases that we deal with. I will turn it over to Mobita so she can speak, and then I'll come back and I'll answer any questions or anything that you may have. I want it to be very interactive. Okay, Mobita? Good evening, everyone. Did everyone vote today? Yes. Give yourselves a round of applause. My name is Bobita Johnson Burrell, and I have been affected by gun violence pretty much my entire life. On March 30th, 1975, my father, it was Easter Sunday, my father was murdered in front of my family as he attempted to save his sister from her domestic abuser. My father died in my mother's arms, which my mother has never recovered from. So Melanie just talked about victim services. Back then, no were no victim services. In 1975, there were no victim services organizations in Philadelphia. And communities of color especially had to pick themselves up and move on with their lives as best as possible. And that's what my family attempted to do. My brother, while well, my mother then suffered with both depression and she attempted to self-medicate with drugs and alcohol. I had a brother who acted out because he was traumatized after seeing my father murdered. My brother was two years older than me. I'm a middle child of three. I had a sister four years young. I had a sister four years younger, and my brother was two years older than me. But I wound up being the adult in the family. My brother wound up in and out of juvenile institutions and then in and out of adult institutions. And then on July 1st, 1991, as his five-year-old son sat on his lap, he was murdered by a boy over a girl. So then we had another homicide to deal with in my family. 
And I watched my mother's difficulty with that because, as I said, even to today, she still has not recovered from my father's death, but then she loses her only son. And again, my family attempted to pick up and move on as best we can, and it made me very hypervigilant, right? When I got married and I had children, I became very hypervigilant about protecting my children from violence. When my brother was murdered, I was eight months pregnant with my third child, and I named my last two children after my brother. So I had my daughter, she was born August 2nd. My brother died July 1st, she was born August 2nd. I named her Charlene after my brother. And then on September 20th of 1992, I had my fourth child and I named him Charles after my brother. So I attempted to pick up and move on and try and take care of my family to the best of my ability. And we were that family in the neighborhood, right? Because my logic was that if I could make my community safe, if we were engaged in the community and we could be a role model for those kids who didn't have that, then that kind of guaranteed that my kids would be okay, right? So even after I went to college and I graduated from Penn and I created a business and I became very, very successful, I made a conscious decision to stay in my Southwest Philadelphia neighborhood because we were that family. You know it's always that one house in the neighborhood, right, that all of the kids gravitate toward. We were that house. We had the big house on Elmwood Avenue, the huge backyard with basketball courts. My sons fixed bikes and electronics, so it was always crap all over my front porch and in my backyard. We rescued animals, so the kids always wanted to be at our house playing with the dogs. We kept fruit roll-ups in the cabinet and juice boxes in the refrigerator. We were that family. Me and my husband would rent 15 passenger vehicles, pack peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and cheese crackers, and stuff everybody's kid we could fit into the vehicle in it to drive them to the beach in Atlantic City or to take them up to the Poconos. And in many instances, this was the first time this kid ever had an experience with sand, besides playing in the sandbox at school. We were that family. In the summer of 2007, July to be exact, at that time my children were 14, 15, 16, and 20. My 20 year old was up at the University, uh, she was up at Indiana University of Pennsylvania working on her bachelor's degree. The three children who were home were 14, 15, and 16. <coughs> And my two sons were 14 and 16, and they followed into my bedroom one day. And my two sons began to tell me, Mom, you know, nine boys shot in this neighborhood. And I sat there, and I listened to my sons as they talked about some of these boys that they had very intimate relationships with. And my son Charles, who was my baby, began to talk about one boy in particular who was a twin. He was in his class at Children's Middle School. And he began to talk about the loss of this boy. And I watched my sons, and I saw the pain, and I saw the anger, and I saw the frustration, and I saw the fear. And I attempted to listen, not only listen to them, but also to assure them that we would do everything that we possibly could to keep them safe. And when my sons left the bedroom, I turned to my husband and I said, my sons will not become statistics on the streets of Philadelphia. I said, it's time to go. Less than six months later, on January 13, 2008, I packed my family up and I moved them to Lansdowne, Delaware County. Small town, 20 block radius, dry town. You can't buy a beer in Lansdowne. Then you go right down the street, we're bought to a pike and it's the state store. Mm -hmm. But in Lansdale, you can't buy your beer. It's a dog town. Everybody knows everybody's dog's name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> January 13, 2008, I moved my family there. Excuse me, January 15th, and I thought we were sick. And I went on about the business of living my life and trying to raise my children to be the best people that they could possibly be. 
And on January 12, 2011, it was just like any other day, it had snowed that day. And I came home from work, and the next day was payday, all of the kids. So at this time, the kids were 18, 19, 20, and 24. My 24-year-old was up at the up at the University of Maryland working on her master's degree at the time. The three children who were home were 18, 19, and 20. They were in and out of school part-time, but they all worked with the family business full-time. And about 7 o'clock that evening, me and my husband were preparing because we've always been very, very involved in the community. Remember, I told you, we thought if we put ourselves into the community that we could help protect our children. So we were preparing to go somewhere, and about 7 o'clock that evening, the three children who were home filed into the bedroom. Now, we're a really, really tight-knit family. We vacation together, we shop together, we eat together. In fact, when we bought this house in Lansdowne, my husband said, are you crazy? He said, why are we buying a bigger house? Like, they'll be out of the house in a couple years. And I'm like, you're crazy. My kids ain't going to be So they filed into the bedroom, and they're talking, and they're laughing. And I had two grandchildren on the way. Charles had a fiance, she was pregnant, she was eight months pregnant, and my daughter Charlene was seven months pregnant. So I had just bought my daughter her first car. It was a bargaining chip. I didn't want her to have a baby, but guess what? She was having a baby. I wanted her back in school, and I wanted to make her life easy so that she could do the things necessary to be successful. So they fall into the bedroom, and Charles stood by my bedside, and Charlene sat on the bed, and Dante sat in the chair. And they start talking. So I know some of you have been here had children, right? And when you have children, you go through those difficult teenage years. So I have this analogy. Around 11 or 12, aliens come down from the sky and they suck their brains out <laughs> through their right ear, right? And they turn into these people. They go from being these people that worship the ground you walk on, that love you, to being these people that you can't stand. <laughs> they start talking bad, they get fresh, their friends become more important. So the aliens had come down around 11 or 12 and suck their little brains out. But around 18 or 19, the aliens come back. They come back down and they put their brains back in through their left ear and you develop these new relationships and they turn into these people. You, you love them the whole time, right? But they begin to turn into these people that you really, really like and all of the stuff that you work to pour into them begins to shine through. This was my ah moment. My children are talking and they're laughing and it was the first time that I looked at my children as adults and I'm like, I really, really like these people, <laughs> right? And, and I turned to my husband and I said, why are we having a family moment? And everybody laughed and I was serious. I said, no, why are we having a family moment? So they're talking and they're laughing and they like when we go on vacations because we go to outlets and everybody gets money and they're like, when we going on vacation, mom? And me and my husband had a habit of doing four vacations a year. We would do two with just me and him and two with the entire family. And we had just come back in October, like we do Disney every year, right? And we had just come back from Disney. I'm like, we're not going on vacation, we just come back. Plus, we got two babies on the way, like be for real. We ain't going on vacation. But they're talking and they're laughing and they're joking, and I'm like, just really liking these people. And something whispered in the bed in my ear, get off the bed and hug your kids. And I got off the bed and I hugged Charles. Charles was six feet tall. And I kissed his neck. And I said, Charles Johnson, do you know how much your mommy loves you? And he giggled like a little kid. And I went over to Charlene, and the aliens had only put half her brain back. <laughs> so I hugged Charlene. Girls are different. You got a girl, you know what I'm talking about. But I hugged her, and I kissed her, and I said, Charlene Johnson, do you know how much your mommy loves you? 
And then I went over to my boy Dante. And I said, Dante Johnson, do you know how much your mommy loves you when I kiss this? And then for some reason I asked my children not to leave the house that night. I said, please don't go out. I even went as far as to try and get the keys of the car from Charles. And this house in Lansdowne we moved into, so the house that we lived in was the house original to the block. And they had the service quarters in the back, and it's like a maze. And I'm chasing, he'd love for me to chase him through the house. And I'm chasing Charles through the house, and I'm like, get keys. And he's like, come get him, Mom. <laughs> and at some point, I gave up. And then I went outside, and I tried to unhook the hood of the car. Now, I know nothing, I know how to put gas in it and drop it. And on a bad day, I can put air at the top. But I tried to unhook the hood of the car. And I meant to tell my husband to make sure that that car didn't move that night. And in a split second, I forgot. So my husband comes outside, and we get in the car, and we go to wherever we were going, and we get home about 8.30. And back then, I was like, I went to bed at 10 o'clock every night, right? And, but I'm one of those people, like, when my hand is to go out, I'm out. Ain't no tossing, turning, rocking, praying, ain't none of that going on. I'm out. And I was out at 10 o'clock. And I sat up out of my sleep at 10.30. And I called Charles' cell phone, and it went to voicemail. And I called Charlene's cell phone, and it went to voicemail. And then I called Charlene's best friend, and I said, tell Charlene to get that car home or she'll never drive it again. Mm -hmm. I told y'all it was a bargaining chip. I did that. And I lay back down and went to sleep. And the next time I woke up, it was 11.20, my cell phone was ringing, and my children's pictures are programmed in my phone, so when they call, their pictures pop up. And I see it's Dante, and I know if my Dante is calling me at 11.20 at night, something is terribly wrong. Now, he's working the overnight shift, so I'm thinking something happened with one of the clients, somebody's sick, something, but I know something's wrong, so I pick up the phone. And it sounds like, and Dante is my boy, you know, what's that candy that's hard on the outside and soft in the middle? He's like that kid that puts up that exterior, but he's really, really sensitive, so you don't see Dante crying, but he's crying on the phone, and it sounds like he's having a panic attack. And all I could say, I said, Dante, you have to breathe. Please just take a breath, Dante. And it seemed like when he could gather himself to take a breath, that he just blurted out, Mom, Chuck got shot. Chuck is Charles. So I sit up in the bed, and my husband said, what's wrong? And I said, Charles was shot. And Dante is crying in the phone, and he said, Mom, he's in Einstein Hospital, he's in surgery. Mom, you got to get to the hospital. Now, my boys were attached at the hip since Charles was born. Dante's two years older than Charles. So I said, okay, Dante, let me, let me see what's going on, and I'll call you as soon as I know something. My husband gets me from Lansdale, Delaware County, to Einstein Hospital in 20 minutes. <laughs> We get to the hospital, my son's in surgery, and we're waiting, and we're waiting. And after some time, a whole team of doctors come downstairs, and when they come down, they want to tell you all this wonderful stuff they did, and I felt like I was in a Charlie Brown movie, you know, rock, 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 like nothing was registering, and I just kept saying to him over and over again, I want to see my son. I want to see my son. I want to see my son. And what did register was Mrs. Harrell, your son didn't make it. And I could not believe that my knees did not give out from under me. I couldn't believe that I didn't hit the ground. And in the back of my mind, I said, thank God I have the wrong key. Like, I said, you need to take me to see my son because I'm saying, you got the wrong key. And they said, well, we got to clean them up first. And after some time, they come back downstairs, and they get me and my husband, and they take us upstairs to an all-sterling silver room. And in the middle of the room, on a slab, in a white body bag, so I took it back. It's my son. And they said, you can't touch it because it's a homicide investigation. And 
And I said, please, I gotta kiss my son. And I said, you can kiss him, but you can't touch him. So I walked around this table. To his right ear. And I called the Adon. The call the prayer. Like I did when he was born. <coughs> And then I recited the first sword out of the Quran, the Al Fatiha, like I did when he was born. And then I kissed his neck and I said, Charles Johnson, do you know how much your mommy loves you? And he said, Okay. I then found out that my son was killed in a total case of mistaken identity. Two boys had an altercation over a girl the day before. They thought that my son was the boy coming back to retaliate. My son knew none of these people. My son went to Germantown to pick up his sister to make sure she was safe. They walked up to the car and my son sat in and the murders on the shooting is on videotape from a they walked up to the car and opened fire in the car, putting four bullets in my son. And the detectives, when they showed me the video, and they showed me he got out of the car, they said, we don't know how that boy got out of the car with the injuries that he sustained. I said he was trying to get to his sister. So, on January 15th, 2008, I left Philadelphia to protect my children from the gun violence. On January 15, 2011, exactly three years to the day I left, I buried my son. You cannot move away from this problem. The gun violence don't care if you're black, they don't care if you're white, they don't care if you're gay, they don't care if you're straight, they don't care if you're Muslim. Christian, Jew, Buddhist, Republican, Democrat. If we weren't safe, you weren't safe. So, when I put my son in the ground, I dedicated my life to making sure that we try and stop this violence for our kids. Three months to the day that I buried Charles, on April 13, 2011. I don't even remember. I did it in my grief and sadness. I know the date because it's on the legal documentation for the 501 c right? I created the Charles Foundation. Charles is an acronym for Creating Healthy Alternatives Results in Less Emotional Suffering. Through the Charles Foundation, we have worked to empower young people on both sides of the gun. We have worked to empower young people to make better decisions other than picking up guns. We have worked nationally to organize victims to do rallies and marches to meet with legislators to help create safe, common gun sense legislation. And we still can't get it right. We still can't get it right. You know, people want to say this is a Second Amendment issue. It's not a Second Amendment issue. The majority of the gun violence that happens in urban communities happen with illegal straw purchases. So we've got a couple of issues. Not only is there an illegal straw, but everybody know what an illegal straw purchase is? So an illegal straw purchase is when a guy and a girl walks into the gun shop the guy picks out all the guns. The girl signs the criminal background check. They then take the guns and put them in the guy's trunk, and the guy pays her a fee. Those same guns wind up in your neighborhoods. Those are illegal straw purchases. Then we have the other issue with semi-automatic long guns where you don't even need a license to buy one. You can buy a long gun on Craigslist without a license, without a background check. 
In May, I went into a gun shop. I'm licensed to carry. I went into a gun shop and I bought an AR-15. Mm -hmm. Shoots 30 rounds. It took me 4.5 minutes from the time I signed the background check to the time I signed the bill of sale. And he tried to sell me bullets. Mm -hmm. And when I told him that it was a prop, he said, well, I can sell you something that sounds like bullets. And he wanted to sell me a pretty carrying case. We live in a culture of violence. So my work through the Charles Foundation, anybody heard of Eating God's Call to End Gun Violence? Eating God's Call to End Gun Violence is an interfaith national organization where our sole mission is to get the illegal guns off the streets, to stop straw purchases, and to help create safe gun legislation. I'm the vice chair of Eating God's Call to End Gun Violence. Through that work, I began well, I was really surprised because when the district attorney's race happened in Philadelphia, like five of the seven candidates came to my home and sat in my living room and was like, you know, can I get your support? And I had aligned myself with one candidate. And then my meeting guys called, people said, you need to talk to Larry Krasner. And I had a conversation with Larry Krasner. And he invited me to come to some events. One was here. He had a fundraiser here. And another was at the FOP, the Federal Order of Police Lodge. I went to the endorsement meeting. I had the opportunity to see Larry Krasner stand in front of 200 police officers, active and retired, and they're hammering questions at him. And at one point, he stops them, and he says, listen, if they're good cops, we're going to support them. If they're bad cops, we're going to lock them up. I changed my alliance. And the reason why, because candidates will tell you what, you, what they think you want to hear to get your endorsement. He was not willing to do that. That spoke about his integrity. That spoke his ability to see the bigger picture with mass incarceration and racism and discrimination and wanting to work to level the playing field for black and brown people. I could align myself with someone like that. And I did. And he later appointed me to be the head of victim services for the city of Philadelphia. And through that office, we have expanded victim services to not just help victims, but to reduce violence. Because I wish I could work myself out of the job. I don't want to keep creating victim services. I want to create less victims. So I work with Melanie Nelson from Northwest Victim Services and we work to engage the victims who are currently in the system to make sure that we are filling the gaps so that people are not being further traumatized by the very systems that are supposed to be helping them. But we are also working to help people to get help through restorative justice initiatives, through economic empowerment, through education, to stop people from committing violence, to stop recidivism, that's the only way we're going to fix this problem. Because you know what I said earlier? This is not a Second Amendment issue. But guess what? It is a constitutional issue. Because all of our children have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> every day to not only help victims but to protect communities and to reduce violence. Thank you.
nothing. And can anybody come, like, even, like, so say somebody knows you're the victim, can they bring somebody to a victim to the justice, or do you have to be a victim to learn how to do it? That's a great question. Okay, so my title has changed from the previous person in my role. Um, first of all, I am the first co-victim of homicide to sit as the supervisor for victim and witnesses services, but my title has changed. I am now the supervisor of victim witnesses services and restorative justice. I have a restorative justice facilitator. Her name is Jody Dodd. Um, she comes from a long background of activism and community restoration. So I don't know if everybody heard Philadelphia was awarded the MacArthur Grant for a million dollars. And what we're looking to do is create diversion and restorative justice hubs. So what we want to do is we want to make it victim-centered, but we want to make sure that victims, because a lot of people think that all victims want punitive sentences, they want punitive consequences, they want maximum time. That is not the case. If you talk to different victims, different victims want different things. Right? Someone drug and alcohol treatment, someone therapy, someone, someone prison. Someone to just tell the offender how the crime impacted their life. So what we're going to be doing is in Philadelphia, we're going to be creating hubs with that four million dollars around the city. There's also going to be a community piece to that where when the victim says, okay, I agree with that offender going into this restorative justice project, but I don't want to be a part of it, members of the community will sit as the victim, right? We're going to do circling. If everybody knows what circling is, that's all of the invested partners sitting in a circle, working through the issues, and coming to a solution. So what we need to do is we need to allow the victim's voice, and Melanie has worked for that for years, we need to raise the voice of the victim, but we need to look at offenders, crimes, and victims differently, right? Because what has happened is the Commonwealth will take the case, whether the victim was the prosecutor or not, and they will proceed, and that office has, has, has typically been maximum time, I'm going to save you, maximum time, maximum time, maximum time. That's not always the solution. So we're looking to do some things different. We're going to be doing hubs, we're going to be doing community circles, and we're going to be doing, um, here's another thing, diversion. Hmm? Yeah, we're going to be doing diversion. So right now we have youth aid panel, but I actually went to California, a team of us, the DA sent a team of us to California two weeks ago to look at common justice and what Sujata is doing there. And Sujata is bringing money to Philadelphia to do more diversion, not just for juveniles, but for adults also. Okay. And how can we get um, Give me a call, I'll give you my card. <laughs> There are other stories of the turtle. My name is Dean Ryan Jenkins. I love the two black family. Right now, I got one of those sons with the Elliot family. Mm -hmm. I already seven. And of the seven, two left in my house. Um, my 17 year old daughter, she on her way to college. My 20 year old son, he's been in and out of juvenile everything, just being a hardy. I've done everything I could. He's been in all the best schools. I can't get this boy to do anything. Um, he did manage to get safe served, got his high school diploma, but right now, at this very moment, he's standing on the corner of 18th and Wallace, just standing there. Yeah. He's not solid for us, but he's around the people who do. Mm -hmm. I walked up to 20th and Brown with him a month ago, and we walked in the store, and he walked behind me and said, Mom, come on. If those are boys, yes, they get ready to try to kill him. We had to come down Uber, Uber Street to get the family to get back, back to our house. What I'm trying to do is not become a victim. And I don't know where to go. So I don't know what to do. So did, when he said that to you, had they assaulted him? Well, no, what happened was, he, this is two separate incidents. I don't know what happened, actually, because he won't tell me. Again, the alien is kicking it. He won't tell me what's going on. But his friends and him, they went through Francisville up to a Chinese store late night to celebrate somebody's graduation. A bunch of boys shot at him over on a ridge in uh, Poplar, over in that area. And uh, it was Rock, Ridge and Rock, the Chinese store around that thing. They ran home, home, 
They chased him literally all through Francis Little. And he said, Mom, they almost got me. When I got to 19th Paramount, I collapsed. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't run. Because I was so drunk. At 11 something, this is when it's happened. At 11 something, this is when I asked for God to put a shield of protection around my son before I went to sleep. He comes home. I try to talk some sense to him. Why do you keep going out? Why do you go outside and tell Go to college. Go get a job. Do something. Mom, I am. I just need. I can't shake this boy. These are two different incidents where he could have gotten killed. Two different group of boys, but he won't tell me why this is going on. So I don't want to become a victim, but I called the police, told them about the area where the guy was. I saw the guy run off to go get the guy. And they were standing exactly at the store on the 28th and Brown. So at this point, I was, I was on my way to get some ice to go with my red wine and sit in the window and look out the window because I don't know when somebody's going to tell me to get sucked around the corner. He just got it. I don't know what to do. So did you reported the first one. Yes. And you have a DC number. Well, no. The, what the officers tell what they'll do is they'll do a walk by, but if I can't tell them who, you know, give them an idea of who did, you know, who's carrying what, which at that point I didn't know. But he was shot at. No, 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 no. So he wasn't shot at. This the shot at incident happened in Princessville. Oh, and I, I didn't call the police. Okay. I didn't call the police because I didn't know about it until three days later when they were just talking about it around the neighborhood. Okay. When all the group of boys that were shot at, they actually went back up there to pick up the shells off the ground. Mm -hmm. I guess these are trophies. So I'm like, what is wrong with you? You, you people here, right? So we're dealing with, I like, like, with like the aliens. Yeah. So they're, they're so much different than like the was coming at. Yeah. Yes. The game has changed so much. So even the drug dealers have changed so much. We talk about the drug dealers back in the day. We didn't condone any of this. They looked out for the yeah, they were the community. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, took, they, they saw Miss Jones coming up, they would help Miss Jones with a bag. Today there is no remorse for human life. Yeah. Yes, they're hanging out with each other. The sad part about it is I go and I speak with you. And they tell me, Ms. Nelson, we are either going to be the predator or the prey. They don't expect to live long. And they're okay with dying young. And it's just, it's alarming. So I don't know how we can get through to your son, give you, give you our, our information. But today, the code of the street is so much different than it was when we were coming up. And they continue to hang with these brothers. And no, they will not snitch. And that's why a lot of people are not getting arrested. They know who are doing things, but no, he, they won't tell you what's going on. So it, it's hard for us to understand because we weren't brought up like that. But we will give you our, our contact information to see how we can help you. If he's serious and he wants a job or he wants to get into a training program, I'm going to give you my card. You don't call me. He needs to make the effort. He needs to call me, and I will plug him in. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. I'm wondering about the intersection between the victim and their voice in terms of the legal proceedings. Like if they had any say, if they were the types of sort of justice circling type approach versus incarceration, do they have to say in that now, or is that something that you could see in the that is something that we are moving toward in the very near future. Once we get the hubs up and running, um, we look at implementing that. So the one thing that the DA charged my new part of my office with is creating this program, which there are things going on around the country. Like I've been to Common Justice in Brooklyn and Red Rock and now um, impact justice in California. He's looking at us to create this model. So the good thing about it is we just got this $4 million from MacArthur, which moves us closer to actually doing it. Because we've been meeting since we came into office in January. But now the money's available, so we are trying to do this sooner, much rather than later. So I foresee it in the very near future. We've actually been doing some already in the DAO. We had some of you know the Supreme Court ruling that it was unconstitutional to commit juveniles to life in prison without the possibility of parole. 
we have actually had the ability to do it with several of the juvenile lifers and the families. So it's, it's, it's been a, a rich experience for both the victim and the juvenile lifers, um, but we're looking to expand it to current, like real-time crimes. Is there uh, a way that if those weapons are used in a case, a murder case or something like that, are those report on weapons registered to a person that they can go back to and ask for this weapon or charge them in a case that these weapons are used in? That's a great question. So all guns are created with a serial number. Yes. Um, so handguns and long guns, if you, there, right now there, so there's a couple things that we're fighting for right now. We're fighting for a lost and stolen gun law, right? Which holds the gun owner accountable. If you lose your gun, if your gun is stolen, if you give it to your grandson as a collector's item, you need to report that to the federal government. Right now, that does not happen, and there are no consequences when that gun is used in a crime. That's number one. Second part to your question is, all of that data is collected by the DEA, and the NRA has sued them, and it is illegal for them to share that information with district attorney's offices, police departments, or the public at large. So that information, that data exists. We were able to identify maybe two years ago one gun used in 27 shootings. Do you know they have something called burners now? Yes. They have where you can go and rent a gun, use a gun, and take it back to the person. They had one gun that was traced back to a gun shop at Front and Washington. It's not front Anyway, it's a gun shop at Front and Washington who is known for illegal straw purchases. One gun was used in 27 different crimes. And they were able to trace that information, but the, the NRA and the gun manufacturers have sued the government where they are not allowed to share that information. So we have a group of district attorneys along with Larry trying to get that information released so that we can use it. So we got a couple things. We got lost and stolen guns, which we're trying to institute. We have a one gun a month law, which we're trying to institute. Meaning if you want to buy a legal gun, that, we don't have a problem with you being able with a license to buy a gun illegally, but buy one gun a month. That stops straw purchases, right? You can't go in a gun shop and buy 10 guns at one time anymore, right? We're trying to do the lost and stolen, the one gun a month. We're trying to stop the purchases of long guns without a license and a background check. We want all guns licensed, all guns background check, all the time. We want to change licensure of how guns are licensed. You got to go through more to drive a car than to buy a gun. So why can't we, you know, Hong Kong, you got, first of all, only 2% of their population owns guns. You have to do a metric evaluation, you have to go through a medical evaluation, you have to take a test, and then in six months, they determine whether you can buy a gun or not. We need to change the way that we give people guns. We need to change the gun culture in this country. Yeah. So, how I know restorative justice is more and more popular in our schools. I'm curious with this Navarro grant and the hubs that you're discussing, if there's any conversation about bringing similar models into school as sort of a preventative measure for students that may find crime as an option after, after school. Um, I, I'm also really curious about um, if you're already talking or if you know about the services that are doing similar work in, in our middle schools, uh, high schools, currently. You guys are a liar. Y'all asking some awesome questions. <laughs> so one, one thing that the hubs will do, it will, so our schools like locking up our kids. Let's get that real clear. They have moved from educating our kids to holding them, and that's the pipeline of prison, right? Um, the police, 
will lock our kids up. They're locking kids up as young as nine years old. One thing the hubs will do is it will change that. So when there's a school-based issue or a community-based issue that involves a juvenile, that police officer will divert from the street. There will be no charging. There will be no police station. This is, this is an amazing model. The police officer will be demanded to take that young person to one of the hubs. And the hub will then work with that juvenile and work with the victim and try and decide with it. Because there are, don't think for a minute. So when we talk about restorative justice, there are consequences for the offenders. There are real consequences for the offenders. It could, first of all, they're going to have to make amends to that victim. If the victim does not want to participate, like I told you about the community circles, they have to make amends to that community. They have to write letters, they have to sit in front of them and apologize, and then what we do is we create a service plan. Okay, so you did this crime, what are we going to do to make sure that you don't do it again? What is it that you need? We're going to look at a holistic, biopsychosocial model. I'm a social worker, by the way. To see what that young person needs to keep them from reoffending, to keep them out of the system. And there's also youth court. There is youth court and there's, there's YAP, Youth Aid Panel, um, which is already part of that model. But the hubs is a whole different piece to it. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.